<laughs> Only time we get to play that right there, man. We got to take them back to 1992, where I'm assuming that's when these two people first met. Yeah. Um, Heather B. and our guest, when that was the first season of Real World, and our guest has since become and always was a political activist, a, po a poet, mm -hmm. a writer, um, an entrepreneur. Um, he's even appeared on the Oprah Winfrey show. I walked with him as he um, had three campaigns uh, for United States Congress of New York City in the 10th Congressional District. He's uh, written for publications such as Esquire, Newsweek, The Washington Post, uh, The New York Amsterdam News, Rolling Stone, as well as Vibe. Um, he's lectured at colleges all over the United States of America, at least 48 states of colleges. He's lectured at Harvard University, United Nations, wow. uh, VH1, MTV. He's done it all. He's written plays. And today he was here to talk about his new book, My Mother, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and the Last Stand of the Angry White Man, the one and only, ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Powell. Yo, he's wow. a loser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's up? Kev, what up, man? How you doing? It's good, it's good to see you, Kelly, Heather B., uh, Everybody here, it's just good to see y'all. It's like a MTV reunion with us three, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, for hey, sure. It's a big one right now, You man. know what I'm saying? Y'all still in there, dog. You are still, I'm in, still there. in there, but man. Holding it down, though, y'all. Hey, man, know? if it wasn't for y'all, I wouldn't have been able to make this check for Get 18 out, years. Thank you, Heather. Wow. Thank you, Kevin Powell. <laughs> <laughs> it works out. Um, I love it. And you know what? And salute to you because um, you did one of the best interviews with President Barack Obama. So much, much respect. Thank to you, you brother. man. Yeah, you yeah. brought a different perspective to it. You know what I'm saying? So Thank you. Got to say that. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, Kev has also interviewed Pac, Tupac back mm -hmm. in the day. One of the most controversial pieces and coverages that hip hop yeah. has ever seen. I um, that's my my. This is the new book I'm talking about now. It's my thirteenth book. Uh -huh. um, uh, the Tupac book I'm working on right now. In the middle of it's going to be my fourteenth. It'll be out. Man, I've done a hundred plus interviews. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of folks from from the Bay Area, a lot uh -huh. of folks from LA, um, a lot of us on the East Coast. It's been a deep book because I I actually have not been to Vegas since Tupac died yeah. September thirteenth, ninety six, because uh -huh. it was that traumatic experience. I haven't known him that well, uh -huh. and um, so you know I actually put this book out first on purpose because everything is happening in the Trump era, and I just needed a a little bit of a break from the spirit of Pac for a second because it's heavy. In the interviews, I've cried, people have cried, we've cried together, it's been yeah. deep. I still want to interview you, brother, I, uh, you know, because I, I actually have audio of you interviewing Pac, and so, you know, it's important uh, to tell these stories, and that's why I write, and uh, that's why y'all, you rhyme, Heather, that's why folks, that's why hip-hop exists, we gotta tell our stories, you know what I'm saying? Uh, we'll talk about that. I don't, I don't do a whole lot of interviews about that Pac moment, of, and if I do, <laughs> I kind of keep it surface for the same reasons, yeah, you know, yeah. as a friend and with uh, so much emotional attachment. Exactly. But speaking about this book, my mother, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and the last stand of the angry white man. Um, Everybody laughs at that end of it. Yeah, it's, <laughs> well, shit, we've seen a lot of angry white men out there. It's mad real. You know, what is? what do you think that stems from? Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because um, there's an ex there's two excerpts of the book on BET.com and on uh, HuffPost right now. And I got an email from a, a, a white brother who said he was a liberal, that he voted for Barack in 2000, 2010, 2012, pardon me. And how dare I say anything critical about Barack Obama? I said, you clearly have not read the book because I also talk about the love that people have for Barack Obama, myself uh -huh. included, and the fact that I voted for him. And then secondly, he said, you know, how dare you lump all white folks together? I said, brother, I don't do that. I love all people. I love all people. I make that very clear. But, you know, we do have to have a conversation about racism in this country and what white skin privilege means. And when we look at what's happening here, it's not just this Trump era. You know, the fact that Barack Obama was the most threatened president in United States history, the fact that racial profiling cases exploded during the eight years that Barack Obama was in office, the fact that he had disrespect of him by people like Congressman Joe Wilson from South Carolina, my family's home state, yelling at you lie in Congress, the fact yeah. that Jan Brewer, who was the governor of Arizona, po pointed her finger in his face. It says to me that for all the progress that we've made in this country, and again, I love all people, let me make that very clear, we still have a long way to go because it's almost like we're going backwards now. The fact that it's 10 years since Barack got elected and we're dealing with the madness of you know folks like myself, me and my wife took a ride down to South Carolina to take my mother down there. The fact that we had to have a conversation like what, what happened, what, what do we do if we get stopped by the police? What yeah. do we do if we encounter some white races? What do we do if we, can, if we see a big Confederate flag? And so my challenge to all people, including my white sisters and brothers, is that you know we got to have some courageous conversations about racism in this country and, 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 and put yourself in the shoes of people who may be different than you. It's no different than us as men, as women are shouting
shouting hashtag me too. We as men, you know, have to understand and have empathy and compassion for when women who have to walk down the streets of New York City who have to deal with harassment in clubs, mm -hmm. you know, across the board, you know, including my mother who experienced it, which I talk about in the book as well, when she was a young woman. So it's really about getting people to have some empathy. The book is about a hope, but also do you have empathy and compassion? And Heather tell you, you know, when we were on that show, it was the first time that a lot of people saw a conversation about race. Norman came out as a queer brother. You know, there was a lot of stuff going on there that actually educated me, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so when I think about it now, like, this is actually the kind of world that I want to live in where there's no racism, no sexism, no homophobia, no transphobia, no classes, no hatred of any kind. And there's nothing wrong with being angry, but it's like, if it's, is it proactive anger? Is it reactionary anger? Reactionary anger is just destroying things. But if it's proactive, how do we build bridges to each other? Mm -hmm. How do we how do we do that? And I know that this has been you all's work for a long time and Brother yeah. Mogul's work, and that's what I'm talking about. You know yeah. what I'm saying? That, yeah. Okay. Um, you and I think, that when you bring back that show, how much you learned, what were the mistakes? What was the biggest mistake you think for you on, that, on doing that show? Um, I don't know, because we, we didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. But it was a big mistake, yeah. not asking for more money, because they got paid. <laughs> <laughs> No, I That's tell them all the time. I'm not embarrassed about it. I shared with everybody here. We got twenty six hundred dollars to do crazy? the show, yeah. and not realizing what was happening at the time. They told us that we were doing a documentary, yeah. and they wanted to film seven artists of a certain age group um, to do the show. That they would pay us twenty six hundred dollars to do it. And uh, the good thing that I would say that did come out of it in terms of finances is that later on we weren't a part of a new way shows were being broadcast. Right. So they yeah. did. Uh, compensate as well. Yeah, okay. um, it, it, that came later the on. The residuals. Years later. Well, no, okay. Yeah, it, it, it came later. But I think for both of us, I, I'll be honest and say that it was a new territory for all of us, Sway. Yeah. People were either coming from their parents' house or coming from living on their own yeah. and thrown uh -huh. into a situation with all different types. Like, yeah. I've never met a Norman before. Right. Not, not, so not that I didn't meet him. We didn't have to live with him. You yeah. didn't have to live <laughs> with him. Yeah, that, that's Interact. a difference. Yeah. Um, Okay, that's interesting. So that show was an educational piece uh, yeah. for, for today's society. When you talk about um, the divide that we're still seeing in this country um, and President Barack Obama being the most threatened president in history, I used to be on the road with him, mm. and I would hear a lot of the racial slurs that was at some point in certain parts of the country were kind of scary, and I'm yeah. not a scary man. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I knew yeah. that that man was protected by plenty of people, but I wasn't. Um, when you look at you fast forward and you look at this reaction to Nike, um, the Just Do It yes. campaign and Glad making, make, yeah, uh, Colin Kaepernick being made one of the faces of it. And then we're starting to see this reaction from people uh, because uh, because of what he said, well, what he kneeled for yeah. uh, what, um, uh, 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 when the anthem plays and you see people burning all this Nike merchandising and, yeah. and they don't even know why. I don't even why, you know, <laughs> why they're burning. <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, let me say this. I, I've, I've been blessed to visit all 50 states in this country um, mm -hmm. as a speaker, as an activist. And a lot of people in this country don't know basic American history. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It's like if you actually know American history, then you know that Francis Scott Key, who wrote the National Anthem, was actually a slave master. And that there was actually a paragraph, taken, a verse taken out of it that it was encouraging slavery and also talking about sending black folks back to Trinidad and Tobago in the West Indies. You know what I'm saying? Just get them out of here. If you actually know American history, then you know that most black folks have ancestry have, who have fought in every single war in this country's history going back to the Revolutionary War. And no, very, very few people are as patriotic, patriotic as black folks. If you take black folks out of the equation, there's no American music. There's barely any gold medals during the Summer Olympics every four years. And so for people to call us unpatriotic because of Colin Kaepernick or Michael Bennett, who's a friend of mine who's playing with the Eagles now, or the football players are standing and protesting, these black players come from the same black communities as the rest of us. And so they see the racial profile and they see the brutality. And they're actually doing civil, peaceful protests, no different than Dr. King and Fannie Lou Hamer and all the sisters and brothers in the 60s. But because football is a multi-billion dollar industry and most of the fan base are heterosexual white men who are completely oftentimes ignorant of American history and they only view black people from the head down as, as bodies you know what I'm saying just entertain us don't be thinkers you know this is why Barack Obama or any of us in this room could be a threat that's what we're dealing with here I mean when I posted the Colin Kaepernick ad and I shout out Nike for what they are doing I got so many angry white males again on my Facebook page on Twitter on LinkedIn saying you know F him and F you and you're stupid 
I'm like, son, are you serious? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, like you know, you don't you don't know me. I don't go on your page and say crazy stuff to y'all. Right. And I can say a whole bunch of stuff about these right wing conservatives in this country, but they come at you and it's, and again, it's not all white folks, but it's a certain kind of white male, straight white male, who's very ignorant and they only see the world through the lens of white male privilege and therefore anything else is a threat to them. It's really fear that we're talking about. It's yeah. fear of, you know, this country becoming a majority of people of color, it's fear of a whole world of majority of people of color. It's fear of the fact that they have family members who listen to hip hop who might be white. And this culture is now inside of them, you know what I mean, and their kids. And it's, it's, it's no different than when you saw white folks spitting in black folks' faces when they were pe protesting peacefully during the civil rights movement. It's the same exact thing, except that they now take it to social media. You feel what I'm saying? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. um, you know. We got Carrie on the line from Maryland. Carrie, you want to comment on this? Yeah, I, I think that we take this a little too deep. For me personally, I'm a huge football fan, I am a white female white privilege, however you want to state it. Um, my problem with the whole situation, I could give a, I, I don't care that Nike wants to endorse this. I, that's fine. The cause is needed. The message is needed. The platform is unnecessary. This guy, for all accounts and purposes, is essentially famous and could choose any platform. There are athletes out there standing up for mental illness, ALS, all sorts of other social issues that we're facing as well, but they're not doing it on the NFL football field. And for me, what he has done is brought division to the front lines of the NFL. This is the one Can place where we can all this? gather on a Sunday. Yes. Yeah. yeah, man, with all due respect, first of all, you know, this is part of the problem. You know, this is part of the problem that we're talking about. The National Football League is 80% uh, black males. There would be no National Football League if it wasn't for black male football players. That's the fact, number one. Number two, the National Football League, out of all the major sports leagues, there's four major sports leagues in America, makes the most money, has the worst contracts for its athletes, but it's the most violent and the most detrimental to their long-term physical health. I'm a football fan. I've been a football fan for about 45 years. I've watched every single Super Bowl, and I'm here to tell you, no, it's not divisive. What is actually divisive is people being upset about these players using their brains, their God-given brains, just the way Muhammad Ali did back in the 60s when he refused to serve in the Vietnam War. And the same attacks that you saw in Muhammad Ali in the 1960s are the same things they're saying about Colin Kaepernick and all these black male football players. And what I say to white sisters and brothers, the ones who are not understanding what's going on, have the ability and the courage to listen and learn and have respect for people that are different. It'd be like me saying to you as a woman in the era of me too, the hashtag Me Too movement, you know, how dare you talk about sexism? How dare you talk about rape and, and sexual assault? I have a responsibility as with my privilege as a male to listen and shut up to you, to my wife, to anyone who says, hey, these are issues that women face. And so we're asking people, have some respect for these men and just don't see them as bodies. And then the last part I'll say about it, as much as I love football, I also have a f problem with the fact that these players are barely ever taken care of, the white ones and black ones and the Pacific Islander ones and the Latino ones after they retire, their bodies are broken down. The NFL is not honest about the concussions issue in this, in this league still, in spite of all the stuff that's been put out there. And so we also need to have a conversation about the fact that this sport is, is a modern-day gladiator sport and brutally violent and is detrimental to these athletes long term. And here we are, you know, mad that they're protesting when it really should be about what about the health of these players and what about their lives? They're not protesting their health and their lives. They're protesting Actually, they racism. do, ma'am. I'm a, a, I'm a big-time football fan. Actually, they no, do no, all of that. I understand. That's a separate conversation. But that's no, it's all together, man. Here. That's part of the problem. What we do in America, what we like to do in America is to kind of put things in boxes, put neat labels on it, and we'll say things like, yeah. not, what we like may to I finish, ma'am? Like right to, and we also like to say things like they're not patriotic, they're not supporting the veterans. And I'm like, actually, the American National Anthem actually has nothing to do with veterans. If you actually know your history, if you actually know American history, that, you know, if you actually know anything about the Pledge of Allegiance, it was actually written by a socialist. Go look it up in the 1890s. And, that's the problem in America. People don't read, don't study. But do study, you have a problem with the national anthem? Ma'am, I have a problem with the fact that it was written by a racist. I think the anthem should be imagined by John Lennon, actually. That's what I think the anthem should be. I think the anthem should be Keep Your Head Up by Tupac Shakur. I think the anthem should be One Love by Bob Marley. I got plenty of suggestions for national anthems for this country that actually bring people so together. without all the history that involves African Americans or Latinos or Southern Pacific, where would we, we have history. We have to make sure that the fact that history was made by African Americans or by white people, we put that emphasis well, you just, on that. It, it, we do that. Right. White, that's a problem in itself. What were you before you were white? I said this to my white sister and brothers all the time. What about Irish history, Irish American history? What about Italian American history? What about Jewish American history? The problem is the notion of white supremacy, which permeates every aspect of society, so it becomes this lens of whiteness. And I say to people all the time, well, what were you before that? And understand, if you walk, watch a movie like Gangs of New York by Martin Scorsese, he shows very clearly here are Anglo-Saxon white folks fighting against uh, 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 foreign white folks who are ethnic, Irish, Italian, German, etc. And so there's a whole history of divisiveness. The football players didn't create this. This country was born in division. The genocide of Native Americans, Africans being turned into slaves, how mm -hmm. women have been treated historically, how any people who have been other 
have been treated historically. And what the players are actually talking about, how do we bring people together to stop the violence against people of color in communities? That's what the issue is about. And let's not focus, let's not change the issue. But why do you do that when it's not during a national anthem to because because in the words of the great the Even great white the because in the words of the great white American because of the words of the great white American uh, philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson in the 1800s there's no there's no perfect time for civil disobedience look up your history ma'am seriously so civil disobedience needs to start on the NFL field because you that's want it to be convenient for you and that's the problem because you're still speaking from no, privilege it's why not they, about being convenient. it is because oh, you're, well, you're well, mad well, 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 I mean it's well, no well, different than it's no different than people being mad at Black Lives Matter for stopping traffic during protests around the country like well they're stopped they're making it impossible for us to get to uh, get to home well guess what it, how do you how, imagine what it feels like to be beat down by the police chokehold if you're Eric Garner we can go down the list of things and so People use their voices in different ways. Again, look at American history, be it white folks, black folks, Latino folks, queer folks. There's been civil disobedience historically. That's the only reason why we can sit here today and have this conversation civilly, because there's been a history of protest and resistance to a lack of democracy. You know, Carrie, but listen, this is what this show is about. Carrie, we appreciate you calling up and, yes. and, and giving your perspective. Because uh, that it, it makes a Thank lot you, of Carrie. sense coming from your lens. And then Kevin Powell, we appreciate this re uh, perspective, too. Mm -hmm. But I, I will say, had he not kneeled during that anthem, we wouldn't be having these exactly. conversations today, Carrie. And that's probably why he did it. And even though folks are offended by it. Sacrificing um, his own career. That's with, how you reach the most people. Yeah, and exactly. what he was kneeling about had nothing to do with uh, questioning his, his patriotism or any of those things. But we're having these conversations, Carrie. Yeah. And Carrie, you're a citizen. This way in the morning. All right. Let me say, Carrie, let me say bye. Okay, Carrie, thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right, peace. Um, Kevin Powell, thank you, brother. Thank you. Appreciate you. No, man, this is what it's all about. This is one of the reasons why you got to read this book. The phone line's lit up. Susan from South Carolina uh, said, well, let me get Susan on. What are, what are your thoughts, Susan, real hey, quick? Susan. South Carolina. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. I just wanted to say good morning, Sway. Um, also, good morning, Kevin. Um, good morning. I, I just think that it is, is a pleasure and an honor to hear you, brother. Um, oh, thank the, you. Everything that you're saying is, is definitely true. I think the fact that people don't want to hear the truth because it hurts. Yes, ma'am. Um, but the fact is Kaepernick took a stand, and we need to be supportive, whether we are whatever color, race, whatever. It's about truth. It has nothing to do with anything else. Yes, ma'am. And that's the fact. That's what's wrong with this country right now. Nobody wants to deal in truth. Everybody wants to keep hiding it. Nobody want to speak facts, but you're speaking facts. And I think when we speak facts, and like you said, it becomes a threat, and it makes people feel uncomfortable, but it's not about their comfortability. Yeah. It's about doing what's right. Susan, you're a citizen. Let's wait in the morning. Oh, wait, hold on. I got a 10-year retired vet on the oh, phone. Oh, but that would be perfect, because sure. my question to the vet, Sway, is actually... Wait, let me say hi. Charles, okay. what's up? Charles, where you at in Maryland? Charlie. Yes, sir, Maryland. Okay, how do you feel about what Kevin is saying? So I absolutely agree with Mr. Powell. Uh, it, it makes no sense to try to, to stop an argument or, or even just a point. He's just showing a point that this is an issue. And, you know, I mean, I, I served for 10 years. I was medically retired. Thank you for the service, sir. Thank you for the service. Absolutely. Any, I would do it again anytime. Uh, but you got to be... These, these people are so narrow-minded. You have to look at all sides of this. You have to be willing to look at the bigger picture. And in the big picture, this is something that needs to be addressed. Yeah. Mm. You yeah. can't continue to push it away. That's right. It has to be looked at. Yes. Well, that's what and I wanted to, to ask heard. Charles and Sway is that, and Kevin, if you have people in the military coming out in support, how do us as civilians, how do we disagree if the military is standing behind Colin Kaepernick? It's very confusing to me, Sway. And Colin has a lot of respect for the military. That's why he s sat down with them, and that's why he decided to kneel. It was after conversations with military veterans. Oh. And what ends up happening with people yeah. who are or, who are uh, in positions of privilege and power, they will twist the conversation to something else and say, well, they're anti the flag, they're anti-veterans, you know, they don't respect the veterans. And I mean, you know, come on, we're not stupid, you know, and again, this is why it's important for all of us to know history and current events and understand this is not what it is this is about racial profiling and police brutality that's what the case this is what the brothers are responding to mm -hmm. this is what they're responding to nothing else is any there's nothing else but that you know what i mean uh charles thank you man i appreciate you. you man thank you for your, your citizen you, no in the morning hey kevin uh one cheers to you brother thank uh, you so for much for your work Mama. that you've done thank you um and in particular it's fascinating listening to the exchange that you had uh with our previous caller yes sir um just kind of the outside looking in 
well, there's always this conversation that we're into our silos, right? Mm-hmm. And we're very divisive with our political discourse. So mm-hmm. if you're on the right side, you're dug into the right. If you're on the left side, you're dug into the left. Then there really is no sway. So as sway. even <laughs> I'm right here, Mike. What do you mean? <laughs> right no, all no, morning. no pun in, intended okay. here. But even this exchange just proves that point. No matter if it's politics, no matter if it's sports, people are dug in. And you had an exchange with her for approximately three minutes. And at the end of the three minutes, she still wasn't moved. So where do we go from here in these moments of yes, frustration when individuals are so dug into these silos, yeah. right? Are we trying to convince those who are on the margins that could be convinced or otherwise? Or now are we all just talking to talk? Well, you know what I say? And that's a great question, brother. I say to people now, um, and this I was I was at, and you may have been there as well in 2004 when Barack gave the first speech yeah. uh, at the Democratic National Convention in Boston when he said that there's no red states and blue states. I say, you know, it doesn't matter if you're liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican. What kind of human being do you want to be? Because let's, yeah. let's bring it back to that. What kind of human being do you want to yeah. be? You know, for me, I'm clear. I'm a heterosexual African-American male. You know, there's things that I deal with, but I also have to be able to see the humanity in other people. Mm-hmm. That's all I was really was trying to say to Miss Carey out there. It's like, you know, you're saying these football players should be doing this on a football field. Have enough respect for their, their humanity. If they're doing this, if they're jeopardizing their own careers, their own salaries, this means that this is very important to mm-hmm. them as black males. You know what I'm saying? And so all I ask people to do, Brother Mike and everyone, is like, can you listen? You know what I mean? And it's like, I don't agree with it. I take the time to actually respond to people. This gentleman yesterday cursed me out in the email. I actually take the time to respond to folks. And Heather tell you, because I was on the real world with her back in the day. I yeah, I wasn't ready for all of that. I was doing my turn up years. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> But I, was, I would not have, re- I would have not had those kind of conversations. So I do think, Brother Mike, we need to have those kind of uncomfortable conversations. Um, you know, and I just want to get folks to, to, you know, in the spirit of Bobby Kennedy and Dr. King and people like that, you know, can we see our commonality? If a white brother like Bobby Kennedy, the day that Dr. King was killed, can speak to a majority black audience in that famous clip on, y'all can see on YouTube in Indianapolis, this white brother, you know, who understood his own privilege, but also how can I reach out to people who are different than me? Yeah. And they had enough respect for him to listen to him. And Indianapolis, one of the few cities who did not explode that night because they saw the humanity in him and he saw the humanity in them. That's what we need to get to. And every time we get somewhere, like when Barack won that night, you know it, Mike, because you yep. worked on a campaign. Mm-hmm. It was a beautiful rainbow coalition of people from all backgrounds. Mm. But almost the moment that after the inauguration, it got ugly again. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And it says that we have to, we as Americans, as citizens, as you say, Brother Sway, we have to be willing to do the work on a consistent basis. A lot of people don't really want to do the work. You know what I mean? Heather hit it on the head. I didn't live with a queer brother when we first, uh, you know, that was the first time I lived with a queer brother when we did the real world with Norman. Since that time, I have become an advocate for the rights of people who are lesbian, Absolutely. gay, bisexual, transgender. Absolutely. All right? And, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and an advocate of women, too. And an advocate of women. Yeah. One of you the producers of She, which is a choreo play. Uh, yes, it's a theater production. It's about ending violence against women and girls and healing and empowerment. Uh, created by your wife, yes, sir, Gina Parker, right? Jenna Parker. Jenna Parker. I got she, married. I got married. She's a playwright, choreographer, dancer. <laughs> if people want to find yes. out more about uh, cor- this choreo play, she, or if they even want to come and, and maybe support it, invest in it, how can they do it? Call me, email me, Kevin at KevinPowell.net, Kevin at KevinPowell.net, and it'll be going off Broadway finally next summer, uh, which I'm excited about here in New York, and it's okay. also going to. Uh, be day, a day, make a debut out in California as well, your home state, brother. So we're excited about it. And, you know, I mean, I do need to say this. I know Annabelle Sciorra. I know Rose McGowan. I know Toronto Burke, who created the term me to, um, you know, to the men out there. Uh, you know, we have to take a stand against gender violence. We have to take a stand against gender violence. This is all of our issues. This yeah. is all of our issues. Just like racism is all of our issues, violence against women and girls, ending it is all of our issues as well. And we can't just say, you know, this has nothing to do with me. I've heard people say that, men say that, and, you know, no. You know, even if you're not the kind of man who would ever do anything disrespectful to women and girls that we who live in hip-hop and i've been in hip-hop since 1978 79 yeah if we're honest about it we know what goes on in our culture you know what i'm saying if you even if you're not the kind of man who would do anything you know do any or say anything crazy about women but you see your homies doing it you say nothing about you become just as guilty back to tupac if you people people go back to the prison interview i did with tupac tupac said he swore to his death he did not sexually assault that young lady in the hotel room, but what he said he was guilty of in that Vibe article mm-hmm. is that I didn't stop those other dudes from assaulting that young lady. Tupac was only mm-hmm. 23 years old when he said that, when he lived at 25. Wow. That's mm-hmm. the kind of manhood that we need. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm talking about. Kevin Powell. Look for him at Kevin at KevinPowell.com. Dot net. Dot, dot net. Dot net. Dot dot net. net. And yes, then you sir. can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Kevin underscore Powell and at Kevin Powell Brooklyn. Kev, thank you. Get the new book, My Mother, my Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and the Last Stand of the Angry White Man. That's thank out y'all. now. Love all of y'all. DJ Love Phoenix, too. thanks for coming up today. Yes. Kelly Kincaid, thanks for the first day. William yes. Shatner, thanks for coming up. He got his new book, too. Yes, he has his book, so it's called Long 
Live long and what yo, I learned Captain Kirk is coming way. up here. He already did. He already, I missed him. Got a new book. Yeah. I'm a right. Trekkie, yo. Oh, I am a Trekkie. That's Wendy crazy. Williams celebrating her 10th Wendy. anniversary. Say yep, it the like Wendy Williams it. show. September 10th. Uh, make sure you watch it on Fox. Uh, she'll be at the the uh, the PlayStation Theater tonight at six yes, thirty. At six thirty. She'll be on WBLS from three to five today in New York City. Kev, one last thing. Yo, that Bobby Brown miniseries is bananas. That's you like it? It's crazy. Oh, okay, cool, <laughs> you so ratchet, Mike Muse. I am how, ratchet. Can, how can I reach you, Mike Muse? Yo, you can reach you on Twitter and Instagram <laughs> at I am Mike Muse. M U S and Sam E. DJ Wonder. Reach me at angrywhitemail.com. I'm just at, <laughs> at DJ Wonder. Find me. All right. Angry uh, White Mail. That's D- real? No, no. Oh, no, no, yeah. No. DB. Yeah. He's one of them, though. Yeah, he's it's definitely angry. He, right. He's well. Reach me everywhere at It's Really DB. Also, real quick, tomorrow is going to be a special edition of Movie Junkie because I will be doing a well thought out, respected review of. The Nun, uh, which comes out tomorrow. The Nun comes out tomorrow. DB, along with a, a lot of uh, well, journalists, select, select journalists, a select handful of journalists, <laughs> got flown out to Mexico, and they did a premiere of The Nun, and they had a lot of little marketing and promotional oh, yeah. things. And he's going to have a full-out report tomorrow about this movie, something you want to see, especially if you're into horror movies. It's definitely something you want to see. Uh, the movie company, the film company, is putting a lot behind this movie, so check it out. Tracy, how can I reach you? Twitter, Instagram, at it's Tracy G, I-T-S, Terry, A-C-Y-G. Also, citizens, I realize I should put you on. I have a new newsletter coming out um, later today, so if you're not already on the list, join the 5,000 people that are on there. Just go to she'sbeautyandthebeast.com to sign up. Did she just you heard us not here, Tracy? 5,000, okay? 5K <laughs> all day, every day. Hit me up at the happy hour, WHB. I'm on Instagram, and I'm on Twitter. All right, I'm at Real Sway across the board. You go to Sway's Universal. We have on the show yesterday. Oh, wow. That's a damn shame. <laughs> oh, brains, Gary Busey. Okay, okay. Our brains are fried. Right, That's the, bad. the actor? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, 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 yeah, was yeah, like, Buddy Holly. Yeah. Wow. yeah, we we uh, yeah. that'll be up on SwaysUniverse.com. Check out all our interviews. Actually, though, Sway, be real. A lot of things up on SwaysUniverse.com. We've had a lot of great conversations. Friday Fire Cypher was dope last week as well. Um, a lot of things up on Sway's Universe, and we're also doing a free listening event right now on Sway in the Morning, uh, as, as well as Sirius XM. Free listening from now until Monday, September 10th, so you can listen to it for free. Go to SiriusXM.com slash on demand. And on that note, we have nothing left to say. <laughs>